I invite our esteemed chairperson, we have a pan-India kind of panel today, Dr. Prateep Vyas from Indore, Dr. Manavdeep Singh from Delhi, he's here on the dais, Dr. Mayuri Khama from Ahmedabad, Dr. Rangaraj from Chennai, Dr. Rajul Parekh from Mumbai, and Dr. Preeti from Mumbai. Dr. Preeti, can you please come on the dais? So without much delay, I invite uh, Dr. Parag Sharma to deliver his first talk. Good afternoon. Uh, due to the short of the time, as per the instruction of the scientific committee, I have to decrease the, my talk time. So the, today my topic is art and science of the performing get, including sterilization and uh, calibration. So the tonometer eye test measures the inner pressure of the eye and also knows the intraocular pressure. The tonometer is carried out by the instrument called the tonometer. So it, it is by the two method, direct, indirect. I, I, we are discussing here about indirect method. That basic principle is applied force which either flatten or indent the cornea. So the ideal tonometry should give the accurate and reasonable intraocular pressure measurement. It should be convenient to use, simple to calibrate, stable from the day-to-day -day practice, and easier to standardize, and free from the maintenance problems. So the application tonometer works with the Ebert Fick law principle, in which pressure inside the sphere is equal to the force required to flatter its surface divided by the area of the flattening. So basically, human eye is not uh, ideally dry or flexible or thin. So to modify the law and W plus A is equal to P A1 plus B. Here the A is surface tension and B force required to bend the cornea. So the cornea uh, receives the flattening and the capillary attraction of the tear meniscus. And in this Goldman tonometer, these two force cancel each other out when the area of the flattening is equal to the 3.06 millimeter of diameter. Uh, this causes only minimal displacement of the fluid in the eye and the pressure reading is unaffected by variation in the square rigidity. So how we take the pressure, I will go directly through the video. So patient should uh, sit comfortably in the uh, chair unit, uh, apply the uh, topical anesthesia and just align the, your uh, prism and the cobalt blue filter is nearly 45 to 60 degree. Just hold uh, the patient's uh, upper lid and uh, rest it in the upper eye, eyebrow and that condition other eye should uh, see straight and meanwhile you can take the pressure there is no squeezing nothing is there then you will get the exact intraocular pressure and just move the dial and then here you are getting nearly 23 millimeter of mercury so another video uh, how we, we will see this meniscus or you can say Myers. This is a thin mire. So I told the patient, blink one or twice so that that uh, fluorescein is, uh, will spread nicely and will get the uh, typical uh, ideal type of uh, uh, Myers. This is the end point where you get the cardiac cycle and the inner point, ha inner circle has joined the inner part. So the ideal uh, Myers. So the application, uh, the po possible errors are like falsely high, low IOP, certain condition like little fluorescein, thin cornea, cholerema, and with the rule of astigmatism and prolonged contact of the prism. And high IOP you'll get too much fluorescein, thick cornea, steep cornea, or against the rule of astigmatism. So still the uh, Goldman application tournament is a gold standard and accurate and reproducible, easy to use. So how, how we calibrate this uh, application tournament? It, it is done at the dial position of 0, 2, and 6, is equivalent to the 0, 20, and 60 millimeter, millimeter mer mercury, respectively. This is a, this is a rod. Uh, if five marks, you see center point is 0. This either side is a 2, 2 or 20, you can say, and the other side has uh, 6 or 60 millimeter mercury. 
I will not go in the detail of this uh, diagram. Uh, this process is only intended to verify the accuracy of the instruments. If the tonometer is inaccurate at any of this dial position, it should be returned to the manufacturer for the recalibration. So in the World Glaucoma Association, the recommendation is about plus minus one millimeter mercury in all testing level zero, two, or six. In APGS, the guidelines within, uh, within is plus minus two in zero, zero millimeter mercury, plus minus three in the 20 millimeter mercury, plus minus four millimeter mercury uh, in the position of the 60 millimeter. So directly I will go in the video so we can save the time. See, this uh, rod has first is a zero, other, other is a two, two we can say 20 millimeter mercury, and then six or 60 millimeter mercury. Uh, then you just keep it in the zero and uh, put it this in the axis and see the uh, calibration. Just you see the here is uh, zero and you have to watch the movement of the biprism. You see here this forward or backward movement of the biprism. Here you see the movement is in nearly, uh, uh, I can say 10. So this uh, tonometer have definitely uh, error. So we should not do this. I, have, I was using this after uh, one and more and a half year. I uh, calibrate this. The, that's why I got uh, this mistake. And uh, put it in the two. And again, you do the same uh, procedure. Uh, put it in the filler. And see the moment of the bioprism. Same uh, if in Indian standard, in Indian scenario, I usually do uh, plus 18 or uh, is not error or plus 22. Means plus minus 2 in the 2 position is normal. So same thing you can repeat in, uh, repeat in the uh, 6 or 60 minute mer mercury. So how do we clean the application tonometer? The Goldman application tonometer prism tip can be whipped with the gauze soaked in 70% isopropyl alcohol and then dry it before use. So another thing is either you do dry height, uh, dry heat and mechanical cleaning with the disposable wipe style gauze. We with this gauze soaked in alcohol or chemical like hydrogen peroxide or merthiolate. Soak this chemical like 70% isopropyl alcohol in 1 to 1000 merthi, uh, merthiolate or 3% hydroxyl peroxide and uh, one, 1 by 10 dilute household bleach. Uh, lastly, uh, the ultraviolet rays or gas sterilization. So many of these methods may be unreliable. So should be why we are using, uh, doing this? To suit of, uh, should be very effective in removing common offending organisms like adenovirus, herpes simplex, or HIV. And this, when we are doing this uh, sterilization, should not damage any part of the uh, Goldman prism like plastic or things, and should uh, not affect the pressure reading point. So the. Uh, well, there are two techniques, one is a whip technique and second is a soak technique. One is then whip technique, the prepared paid or gauge soaked 70% isopropyl alcohol is used to apply the tip of the prism for 10 seconds. The small video, the last. So this uh, you can uh, use either hydrogen peroxide or uh, bleaching powder and third is uh, isopropyl alcohol. And just uh, <coughs> Take it out the prism and uh, this uh, any type of mm -hmm. like tissue paper or uh, paid gauze you can just uh, Focus. touch it in one, one second. Just touch it for the I 10 mean. second and dry it and then again you can use the uh, application by prism for the next patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parag, for this wonderful talk, uh, just in eight minutes. Those who want to go in details, they can see my video on this topic, which has got more than 1.5 lakh views by now. Uh, it has got two editions, and for those who have a large number of application tonometers, we have put up a video on care and calibration of tonometers as well. That includes not only GAT, but the other instruments uh, as well. So you can go through those uh, videos. That Thanks, next. Dr. Uh I wanted you only to comment on this because uh, of your video. So in the interest of time, we'll go to the second one. I recommend everybody to see his video because uh, 
in fact there are two videos one is an older one which was put up way back in 2008 and the latest one which was put in 2015 16 that is 14 minutes video this is a complete video in itself on this topic so i think this is a glaucoma diagnosis and management is incomplete without gonioscopy this simple test test gives tremendous amount of information and even a simple primary open angle glaucoma cannot be diagnosed without looking at the angle there are different types of gonio lenses like copes lens barkens lens swan jacob or richardson for direct gonioscopy and a single two mirror three mirror or four mirror for indirect gonio <laughs> okay yeah i think that's only better gonioscopy this is how a copes lens looks like and that is used for gonioscopy in supine position especially for children under general anesthesia change to the slanting position by moving this knob and then the concave part of the lens is filled with saline and is inserted onto the eye the angle is then examined directly under the microscopic view that you can see you can put saline on the most commonly used lens for indirect gonioscopy is four mirror that has the contact surface smaller than the corneal diameter and is of same shape whereas the two mirror lens has a concave surface and is larger than the corneal diameter to perform gonioscopy position the patient appropriately on slit lamp examine the ocular surface and note the condition of the optic nerve with undilated pupil explain the procedure to the patient and instill the topical anesthetic agent for a two mirror lens use lube use a topical anesthetic agent is it audible swan jacob or richardson for direct gonioscopy and a single two mirror three mirror or four mirror for indirect gonioscopy this is how a copes lens looks like and that is used for gonioscopy in supine position especially for children under general anesthesia the microscope position is changed to the slanting position by moving this knob and then the concave part of the lens is filled with saline and is inserted on the eye the angle is then examined directly under the microscope if you're not able to hear i can audio it so i think we saw how a two mirror is okay i'll go ahead interest of time because we have seen this you can close the audio please So now you watch the corneal surface so so that you know that you're not doing any harm to the patient by doing gonioscopy the surface is all right you use a topical anesthesia and uh, then the patient is ready for taking it now this is a two mirror where you need a coupling agent so you ask the patient to look down uh, fix the lens over it uh, since it is a coupling media it holds very well then you can look at the angle increase the magnification Uh, in case of a four mirror it is very simple you just hold the lens in front of the eye you ensure that the uh, tear film is uniform between the lens and the cornea that is when you start seeing the angle and then you can go to the angles now uh, this is how you look at the angle but the ideal technique that you should use is the room light has to be off and the beam has to be small so as to understand what is the angle in the physiological stage or, or scotopic state and after that you increase the light because if you don't reduce the light your uh, angle would appear artificially open to take the video i had increased the light so this is the correct technique that is actually you should follow look at all the angles under the, the those conditions now these are all different examples of uh gonio angles which i will explain now these are the structures that you can see so this is an oblique illumination in the inferior angle that you see to localize the shawl base line the technique that you use is called uh, wedge technique now uh, here you can see the two 
uh, slit beams going on and where the decimates end the beam collapses because the light can no longer go beyond that so you start seeing a single slit. This is called corneal wedge sign to identify the Schwalbe's line, uh, the anterior most structure and uh, um, if in case you are not able to see otherwise so this is a quick technique and then you see the structures like trabecular meshwork, scleral spur and ciliary body band. Uh, there are different angles which can have different type of pigmentation so you have to be aware that even the normal angle can look different uh, if the pigmentation level is different. This is where you can see the pigmentation anterior to Schwalbe's line which can be an indicator of angle closure so you can see the angle is opening on indentation here so this is one of the PACS. Uh, you can see the patchy pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork that is another sign of prior occlusion which indicates that the patient would require intervention. These are the gonio sinecae you can see in the inferior angle uh, suggestive of uh, angle closure, uh, primary angle closure or glaucoma and here also you can see a sinecae. Uh, this is again uh, gonio sinecae so that is a classical example of primary angle closure. Now in this angle you can see that uh, once uh, you see the convex iris surface which is suggestive of the plateau iris syndrome. So you have a convexity near the angle and then there is a depression. This is called sine wave sign. So you will see all of the signs of angle closure and along with that this sign which is suggestive of plateau iris. This is the blood in the angle after injury. Sometimes you can miss it and uh, this is the area where you can see the angle recession. You can see uh, angle recession, widening of ciliary body band. These are black balls in the inferior angle, suggestive of old high fema. So this is a trauma patient. And uh, these are uh, iridodialysis and cyclodialysis. This is how it looks like when you do gonioscopy. Uh, both the things you can see in the same patient incidentally. Here you can see the silicon oil bubbles in the superior angle um, which can indicate the cause of glaucoma in a patient who has undergone vitrectomy. So it's called inverse hypopion. A foreign body, this is a glass foreign body in uh, one of the patient who had uh, a car accident and presented to us with, high, uh, with the vitreous hemorrhage. So sent to me for uh, gonioscopy and we found a foreign body there. This is the... Um, uh, this is the uh, angle where you can see the blood vessels. This is new vascularization of the angle. These are broad PAS post uveitis or inflammatory situation where you can see the broad based uh, synechia in the angle. Sorry. It's okay, we don't want that. So this is an iris cyst that you can see on UBM uh, that can also be picked up. This is a mass uh, which can be uh, detected on angle and can require further uh, this thing. There's a Krukenberg spindle you can see which is uh, visible on the slit lamp and when you look at the angle you can see a classical concavity which is suggestive of uh, PDS or pigment dispersion syndrome. Uh, that is again, um, uh, you can see the pigmentation, uh, uh, increased pigmentation on the trabecular meshwork with Let's concavity. This is a sampolisi line and pseudo exfoliation. Pseudo exfoliation material can also be seen in the angle. This is a internal ostium which you, you can see is patent post uh, trabeculectomy. When the post trabeculectomy there is a failure of uh, or the pressures increase we tend to look at whether the internal ostium is patent. This is a closed internal ostium due to iris. That means you would require another surgery and uh, working on the external surface would not help. This is one of the express shunt tips that you can see on uh, gonioscopy. So sometimes you can miss it if a small uh, area is not uh, looked at. So there's a steel implant express shunt that can be seen. So basically it is important to understand that how do you look at the angles, as I said, under dark room and then uh, increasing the light. It's an important tool for diagnosis and management of glaucoma. And uh, that is where I would end because I think we will stop here. It's in interest of time, we have already lost time here. Uh, just so one I thing I would like to say in the words of Tom, Ravi Thomas that do 1000 cases. Yes. And that's the only thing that you need to do. Rest of the things you can read from books. Just do 1000 gonioscopies. Dr. Preeti, one quick comment from you and then we go to the next talk. As we have and people always say, it stops, it breaks the flow of their clinic and it's difficult to learn, but no, if you can learn FACO, you can learn gonioscopy. So, and it does not, in fact, doing an UBM OC, ASOCT breaks the flow of the clinic and not doing gonioscopy. So it's something which everybody can learn, right? So we have the uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh,
Dr. Mehta, she will be talking on glaucoma or no glaucoma, optic disc assessment. She has a wonderful photographs of various discs. Thank you, Mayuri, Preeti, and all my colleagues. Uh, I'll be talking on optic now. So, ONH science in glaucoma can be very subtle and what we cannot see what the brain doesn't know. So, we have to really be careful and know all the signs of glaucoma. So, here you can see that there is a thinning of NRR with a subtle retinal hemorrhage inferiorly at 6 o'clock. So, systematic approach is important which improves detection of glaucoma and it has a ONH science has a high sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of glaucoma. Clinical evaluation can be done by direct ophthalmoscopy. It has limited advantage, lacks stereopsis. Stereoscopic examination can be done with slit lamp, non-contact lenses, 78 or 90 D you can use or Goldman and Zeiss four mirror central part you can use. Detailed drawing is needed for this. So baseline documentation should be done uh, by drawing color, red free photographs, stereo photographs if it is possible because this helps us in identifying the uh, progression also. So, before going into, we should know what is NRR. So, we should know what is the cup margin and the disc margin and follow the NRR follows the ISNT rule. So, cup horizontally is always more than vertical. Identify the age of the disc, follow the course of the blood vessels within the optic disc and identify the inner cup margin. So, that is the where, where the inner margin of the neuroretinal rim is there. So, here also identify the age follow the disc vessels and identify the neuroretinal rim. So, this is a cup margin can be also identify the circumlinear blood vessels because they normally are across the cup margin and then they traverse the NRR. So, this is also a very important sign to identify. Uh, one should also know physiologic variation and should not label patients as having glaucoma. So, there can be small size disc, mid size disc and large size disc. So, how to identify them? So, this is a small disc. So, you map this with the disc diameter and if it is more than 2 or like 2.5, this is definitely a small disc. Next is this is a small disc which I mapped on medium disc also and now here you can see it's almost 2. So, this can be a medium disc with medium cups which is totally normal. The next is large disc. So, these are the small and which are mapped over here and this is a large disc which, uh, disc which is shows like just 1.5. So, this is a large disc with large cups. So, high CD is also very important and we should not ignore these patients because they can have some neurological problems also. So, large discs with large cups with healthy NRR can be normal but investigate and document because later on we might find that 0.8 running into 0.85 would be very difficult for clinically to judge. Uh, always account for refractive error that this patient has tessellation along with tilted myopic disc. So, this is definitely not glaucoma. But again document with serial photographs or serial fields to see. Myopic tilted disc also you should mark as thin, can be mistaken as thin NRR. So, you should mark them, document and always investigate. Tilted disc syndrome you should keep into mind and this is definitely not a glaucomatous disc. So, there are various signs in glaucoma. We will see them uh, at a very fast rate. So, disc asymmetry can be a very suspicious sign of glaucoma. As seen here, the right eye it's normal because the left eye disc is large so the cup is also large so that there is a disc asymmetry and cup asymmetry but the down slide you can see that see that that is a traumatic glaucoma so cd asymmetry of 0.2 or greater is significant and should not be ignored vertical enlargement of the cup is again another sign so left eye there is a vertically oval disc which is a normal and with a normal nrr but here you can see that there is thinning of nrr and if it is a uh, Along with a RNFL thinning superior temporally and inferior temp temporally, then this is definitely glaucoma. Pelar cup discrepancy is a pathognomonic sign of glaucoma, and here you can see that the cup is very cup is larger and the pallor is very small and it is accompanied by a RNFL thinning over there. So always look whenever you have a suspicion, always look for a RNFL thinning along the thinning of NRR. So pallor more than cupping is definitely glaucoma. But uh, sorry, uh, cupping more than pallor is glaucoma, but pallor more than cupping may not be glaucoma. So, differentiate always pallor from cupping. So, rim pallor in glaucoma is very rare. So, you can see here that the, there is uh, thin uh, pallor on the 
NRR also and cup is very small. So if you investigate this patient, you can see that he had multiple problems. He had chronic microvascular change, ischemic changes, but someone had labeled him as glaucoma and he was using four anti-glaucoma medications for this is condition which was definitely not glaucoma. Again, another conditions where you can see a pallor of the disc, but watch for other ocular signs. So here you can see a cherry red spot along with some embolisms in the artery. So this is definitely CRAO and not glaucoma. Left eye also that is tributary arterial occlusion. So this is not glaucoma. Uh, in retinitis pigmentosa and primary optic atrophy also, you will be able to see that the pallor is much more uh, than the cup and this is a totally different thing and should not be labeled as glaucoma. Uh, concentric atrophy can be seen in glaucoma and here you can see it is uh, along with the thinning of inferotemporal NRR. Laminary dot sign is seen because of the loss of the neuronal tissue which is progressive and you can see the fenestrations in the lamina cerebrosa and this is a sign again for glaucoma. Advanced cupping of will obviously it is not difficult to miss. Uh, so the other signs like vascular signs, always look for sphincter, uh, splinter or trans hemorrhages because this is a significant finding and it can be a first sign of glaucomatous da damage. It always precedes RNFL defects, notching and visual field defects. Very common in patients with normal tension glaucoma or if the patient has large IOP fluctuations, not controlled on medication, you would find this sign. Uh, this is common location is inferior temporal quadrant. It disappears ov over some time and may re reappear in new location. Uh, and this indicates that the patient needs more aggressive therapy. Bayonetting is sharp 90 degree or more turn of blood vessel as it dips into it because there is a loss of neuronal tissue. The vessel goes into it and comes and travels again on the NRR. So this is called as bayonetting. Uh, the next is bearing of the circumlinear vessels. So because of the neuronal tissue, the circumlinear vessel appears as bare. So this is again an important sign. Overpass cupping is the vessel traverse over the cup and suddenly collapse into it. So here on OCT also you are able to see that the, there is a bridging like thing. So this is called as overpass cupping. So vascular signs, this the first one is NVD and not glaucoma. So this is not a disc hemorrhage. Next bayonetting, it can be seen in deep glaucoma cups also but though inferiorly this is glaucoma which is uh, bayonetting sign is seen in inferior temporally and this is again normal but the, inf the down is the bearing of the circumlinear vessels. Then coming to peripapillary changes. So RNL defects can be seen even in normal patients but they look like this. So the caliber is less than the blood vessels. They do not reach the optic nerve the and they the disappear energy. and appear. Yeah. Uh, after some time. So these are again slit, some slit defects. This is a wedge defect inferiorly and superior temporally also and this is diffuse RNFL loss over here. So is this a normal ONH? If you only look at the optic disc, it is very difficult to see but if you see the RNFL inferiorly, there is a RNFL thinning over there. So peripapillary atrophy we know can be normal alpha zone atrophy, beta zone atrophy can be seen in glaucomatous patients. So beta atrophy, this is normal in myopia. In moderate and advanced GON, it looks like this. So always watch for progression, like here, the retinal hemorrhage, which is there, RNFL defect is also there, and the retinal hemorrhage is again in some other location. Here also, there is increase in the RNFL defect. Uh, Meeda, can you please? Uh, yeah, yeah, last slide. So these are some uh, discs which it's not possible for us to judge whether it is glaucoma or not. So these are the signs which we see in our patient. This is one patient. This is another left eye of the same patient, RNFL thinning and don't forget documentation. Comorbidities is also there, so you should always look for if there is any neurological problem. So uh, take home messages, note the disc size, NRR is important, not CD, check for pallor cup discrepancy, always find and observe uh, vascular signs, evaluate RNFL defects, note the signs of progression, Keep a level of high uh, suspicion when the findings are atypical and keep in mind that everything that looks like glaucoma may not be glaucoma. Thank you for your patience. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Medha, for this uh, very important talk. We can have Dr. Mayuri a uh, brief comment over the talk while we are loading the next talk. She has covered almost everything. Uh, need not have to okay. surplus anything, but... Uh, Always look at the disc and look with the green filter also that is there in the slit lamp. And stereoscopic view is must. Use the 90D or 78D 
these are the simple things and the this photograph if you can take of all the patient as a baseline that's a good idea dr prateep yes can you come forward you are one of the chair persons please <laughs> so we have next talk by dr digvijay singh but he is unable to come here because uh, he is uh, not well so he has sent his talk with the voice over so we'll just play that i know sushma but there was no place <laughs> this one so i want you to be here in front sir <laughs> for the central 30 degrees field of view before coming to the interpretation of the perimetry printout i will briefly explain to you how to perform a static perimetry this here is a humphrey perimeter the patient needs to be seated comfortably his chin on the chin rest his forehead towards the forehead rest you would have to give a near addition if the patient is in the press biopic age group through a rimless lens you give him the trigger in his hand which he has to press every time he sees a spot of light a fixation target either a central fixation target or a small diamond or a large diamond target can be given based on his visual acuity and the patient is asked to press the trigger every time he spots a light inside the dome this is what the typical humphrey perimetry printout looks like on top you have a patient identification parameters as well as the reliability indices and the machine settings then you have the threshold parameters you have the gray scale on top then you have the probability plots below you have the pattern standard deviation plots on the right below and on the extreme right you have certain parameters such as the mean deviation the glaucoma hemifield test as well as the pattern standard deviation values the top half of the field gives the patient's name the type of test that has been done then they give reliability indices as you see on the left fixation losses should be less than 20% anything more than that gets marked with a double cross fixation losses occur when the patient responds to a stimulus in his blind spot area false positive errors should be less than 15% these are normally occurring when the patient presses, presses the trigger in the absence of a stimulus false negative errors more than 30% is unreliable and these happen when the patient does not respond to a previous spot that he has responded to in the past then it mentions the test duration it mentions the stimulus it mentions the strategy used as well as a few other parameters as you see on top the date of the test is very very important and right on top is the eye that has been tested in the bottom half of the printout you have the total deviation plot which is looking at the values compared to age matched controls a minus means that this patient has a lesser sensitivity or there is a field defect in that area then you have the pattern standard deviation which subtracts all the values from the seventh highest point and takes out a pattern deviation below that you have the probability plots which are coded as dark black or gray or a dot this is the typical print seven in one printout that is seen in an octopus perimeter most of these uh, parameters are similar to that seen in the humphrey's visual field an additional bebe's curve is seen here the top half of this printout mentions the patient details the date as well as the eye being tested the bottom portion carries the parameters of the test and two specific features you can see here are the catch trials and the questions slash repetitions these are referring to the fixation losses and false positives similar to what is seen in the humphrey's perimeter the middle part gives you the comparison plots followed by the probability plots as well as the corrected comparison plots and the corrected probability plots which are similar to our pattern standard deviation in the humphrey's perimeter instead of a gray scale you can have a colored scale here on top which can give you a overview of the defect 
you have what is known as the defect curve or the Bebe's curve on the right. This curve is giving an indication of what the field defect looks like. The dark black line is the curve. If it is within the two or three uh, lines on top, then it is normal. If the whole dark line is to the complete bottom, then that is a generalized depression. If one part of that is getting dipping below, then it's a specific or a localized field defect. And we'll come to a few examples later in this presentation. Let us see a few examples. This is what a normal Humphreys printout looks like. Here you can see a field defect in the superior field, which is there both in the total deviation plot as well as the pattern deviation plot. You can observe on top that all the reliability indices seem to be normal. There is also a foveal threshold on top, which is slightly abnormal. Overall, there is a reduced mean deviation and a pattern standard deviation indicative of a field defect. This is almost like a superior arcuate defect. Here you can see a central field defect. Again, if you want to read this printout, first look at the reliability indices which appear normal. We know it is the left eye which is tested. We can see that there is a central a depression in the central field in the total deviation plot. And this a part of that persists in the pattern deviation plot. And you can see that there is a connection with the blind spot as well. This is another case where the left eye has been tested and you can see that there is a superior arcuate defect. Here is a printout which is showing a more severe field depression. You can see there is a bi-arcuate defect. A small temporal island of field seems to be uh, present and you can see that there is a severe de depression in the mean deviation. This is a perimetry printout showing a generalized depression of the visual fields. When the visual fields are too depressed, you can see that the machine does not calculate a pattern standard deviation because the generalized deviation itself is so much. This is an octopus printout 7 in 1 showing a normal visual field. This is an octopus printout 7 in 1 showing a generalized field depression with localized field defects. Notice how the Bebe's curve is entirely below the normal lines, but also dipping sharply towards one end. This octopus printout is showing a localized defect. See, there is no generalized depression of field in this one. This octopus printout was showing a slight field depression in the generalized field there is no localized defect. You can see that the defect curve is just below the defined normative lines. This was done uh, in a press biopic patient without giving him the near addition. This is a different type of printout from the octopus perimeter itself. This is a Humphrey-like printout. You can see a central visual field defect here. But this is just to show that the octopus can also give a printout in this format to make it easy to compare with the Humphreys visual field as well as for people who have more comfort reading the Humphreys printouts. Thank you for your patient listening. So we thank Dr. Digvijay to, send, to be able to send his presentation. I would request... Yes, please. What we are looking at in a visual field is basically the pattern of defects. So when you look for pattern of defects, see glaucoma is very typical. It has a very typical way of showing you the visual fields and the damage also. So what we are looking at is the actual pattern. So as long as all the, your reliability indices are good and things mm -hmm. like that, what you need to do is to look for, see for example, these are just random spots. So are they forming an arcuate? That's what you look. And the baby curve, what it does is it ranks all the test points according to the sensitivity from right to left. So right is the highest, I mean the left is highest, the right is the least. So what happens is they also do the uh, local defect which is this particular area. So when there is a generalized depression of the baby curve, 
it means that there is a generalized depression. It could be due to cataract, it could be cornea, it could be media opacity. So always look for the pattern. So when you're looking for the pattern, take the statistically validated uh, uh, kind of tables. Now this is common for both HFA and it is also common for octopus. They just call it in different names. The basic premise is absolutely the same. It's just that some representations may be difficult. And in the newer ones, you also have the actual glaucoma tester, I mean, I mean the um, thing. See, uh, I think this is an older software, so you don't have the actual glaucoma hemifield equivalent in the octopus. So even that is there, then you also get a Brucini staging. So you print out what you have in front of you, whether it is octopus or HFA, all the information is in front of you. So look at these two statistics and then draw your conclusion. If, if you want it to be quick. So look for the pattern and see where these patterns occur. In fact, in one of them, he has even shown one which is uh, kind of paracentral. See, uh, this is not my um, slides, but I can show you. Yeah, so this is absolutely normal. So it can be HFA or anything. So it should actually not matter. Look for the pattern of the defect. As long as it is statistically validated, that is what you're paying for because that's where the normative database is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rengaraj. Uh, now we have uh, Dr. Devang Ambo presenting uh, about how to detect earlier and faster OCT in glaucoma. Thank you, Dr. Sushma, for the kind introduction. Uh, Dr. Devang, this one. Yeah. yeah. So at the outset, I would like to thank the AIOS and the scientific committee for giving me this opportunity. Yes. audio And without wasting much time. So the first thing that uh, we should know is that RNFL defects, the retinal nerve fiber defects, are the earliest sign of glaucoma, and it precedes disc changes and visual field changes. And if you look into the ganglion cell, since the RNFL is only composed of axons, assessing the retinal ganglion cell itself may be a more direct way to measure ocular damage due to glaucoma rather than the measurement of the RNFL. So the next question comes, what is the need for doing OCT? So OCT gives a quick and objective scan of the optic nerve head, retinal nerve fiber layer, and the ganglion cell, which is helpful for early diagnosis. And uh, once diagnosed, it is very helpful in monitoring progression. So this is the need of the R to, uh, uh, as Venrab has said, if we detect early, we diagnose early, and if we diagnose early, we prevent blindness. So our aim is to prevent blindness. So if you look at the OCT printout, at the top, we have the signal strength. So this is basically the most important thing. If the signal strength is six or above, only then consider it, it to be reliable. Otherwise, take it with a pinch of salt, better to repeat it. If you look at the zones, uh, in the zone one, we have the patient identification data. The zone two is mainly tables and ratios. The zone three is basically the testnet graph, the uh, double lump RNFL graph of both the eyes. The zone four is uh, the red free uh, fundus, uh, optic nerve head photograph. The zone five is the testnet graph with the age match control. It is giving uh, uh, the green, whether, the, whether it falls in the green or uh, the uh, against the age matched. And the zone six is the uh, uh, quadrantic as well as uh, clock hour presentation of the RNFL data. Similarly, if you look at the ganglion cell printout, we have the macular ganglion cell, and we also have a sectoral uh, representation, and we have the table with the uh, average uh, thickness and the minimum thickness. So the norm normative data is between 65 to 80 microns for ganglion cell, and for the RNFL, it ranges between 90 to 110 microns. So just uh, to give a uh, uh, case-based discussion, so this patient, 26-year-old female, who was referred from the refractive lab to us with a power of glasses of minus 6.25 diopter sphere and minus 1 diopter cylinder, and they had done an NCT, and NCT I I IOP was 22 and uh, 24, and when we did a uh, appellation tension, the IOP ranged between 18, and uh, luckily the corneal thickness was fine, and if you look at the discs, uh, you, we can see definitely there are tilted discs and the important thing was that she had a family history of uh, glaucoma and this patient need to be evaluated. So we were, went ahead and did a RNFL OCT and in the RNFL OCT where inferiorly we can see a tilt, we also see there is an area of 
thinning. We do a ganglion cell analysis also and we correlate the thinning with the ganglion cell analysis and we clearly see that this area is clearly co correlating. And you look at the left eye, although RNFL is not showing any defect, but ganglion cell has started to show some early changes. So the, this patient uh, was counseled and, uh, and then regularly followed up. Visual field was normal. So this is the second patient. This is the other end of the spectrum. The second patient, a 62-year-old male who had come for, for blurring of vision, and uh, uh, we did an opportunistic screening. So all, on doing the uh, again the cup disc ratio, if you look at the fundus, as uh, uh, discussed by the previous speaker, we definitely see that the there is definitely neuroretinal rim thinning in this patient, and we can't leave him. The visual field was normal. You do a RNF OCT. This is the other end, the RNF velocity is green, so we have counseled the patient and to, to regularly follow up. So this is the third case. If you look at the fundus picture, there is definite asymmetry of both the optic discs. So definitely right eye looks to be glaucomatous. We did the RNFL OCT for the same, and we see that the right eye has, uh, uh, it is abnormal. It shows uh, in the red area, especially the superior and temporal inferior. But you look at the left eye, which seemingly, although uh, there was no definite uh, uh, notching, but we see that there is an inferiorly thinning. See, we always do a, a visual field to correlate, and we see a so inferior awkward defect, which is correlating with the superior thinning in the right eye, and the left eye does, doesn't have any defect. We also did a ganglion cell just to have a picture of the left eye because now the right eye is diagnosed, the left eye patient wants to know what is happening. So left eye early changes are happening. So left eye is basically pre-perimetric pre and this needs to be explained. So once we diagnose the patient, uh, uh, we, we detect the patient and we, we diagnose it early. The next point is to monitor the progression. So for this, we have the guided progression analysis. So this is, the print, this is how the printout looks like. The, at the top, we have the RNFL thickness map. And then we have the RNFL thickness change over time. So for a guided progression analysis, we should have two baseline uh, 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 scans followed by two follow-up scans to, make, to uh, give a def definite diagnosis of progression. So in this, if you look at the two baseline, it seems normal. And in the third, we see it's yellow. It means there is a possible change because the change has noted only in one exam. And once it, it comes red, it means that the change it was there. It is sustained in two cons consecutive exams. And we can definitely diagnose that this is a progressed patient. So this is the first example of the GPA, where we see uh, in, the th in the third exam, there is a yellow yellowing which is happening. And in the fourth exam, there is redness. So this patient is definitely progressing. And we should uh, again uh, uh, you know, re-evaluate the target pressure and re-evaluate our management for the same. This is another patient. If you see at the uh, RNFL average thickness, uh, uh, RNFL uh, map, there is definite uh, uh, cupping which is there. And there is definite defect. But on follow-up, you don't see any progression. So what is happening? So if you look at these uh, values, if you look at the scan, you look, look at the values, you see from 66 microns, it has reduced to nearly 59 microns. So basically, there is a pitfall, there is a limitation of the uh, of the OCT that RNFL defect cannot be uh, actually zero. So beyond 50 microns, it can never go zero because there are glial, glial tissues which are there. So that is why it, even if it is progressing, the defect will not come. So patients who are moderate or, uh, or uh, advanced diseases cannot be, the progression cannot be detected. And these patients should be followed up uh, on visual fields. This is another example of a patient who had presented, uh, and we can see there's a definite asymmetry between the two optic discs. The right eye has superior thinning, also has uh, superior more than inferior thinning. And as he followed up the patient from 2016, uh, and we look up, look uh, also look at the uh, GPA, which is there, we can see that there's a reddening in the area, which shows that there is definite progression for the patient. And now, the pres presently now, the patient the, it is basically, even after giving maximal medications and operating on, it has progressed. Uh, uh, the right eye has actually progressed uh, as compared to the left eye because the right eye had presented at a very advanced stage with respect to the left eye. 
So this is another example where uh, we, we the if if you look at the uh, discs there if you especially the left eye that's superior it seems to be a superior thinning and an inferior notch we did an rnfl oct uh, for the same and we saw that right eye there's a superior defect in the left eye we can see there's a superior and a corresponding uh, defect which is there and on follow up this defect is progressing dr deva we need to wind up. Yes, ma'am. Last, uh, for myopic patients, uh, as, we is, as can be seen on the disc, this is uh, clearly seen that it's a myopic tilted disc. So for myopic, myopic patients, we do uh, uh, take OCT with a pinch of salt. But you, if, if you follow up these patients, you will come to know that whether these patients are progressing or not because the patient's data, baseline data itself is his, uh, his uh, baseline data on which we, we compare. And we can see that the, now, after at least two years, the patient has progressed and this and uh, therefore management should be undertaken as per that so OCT does have its artifacts and it has been shown that nearly 50% scans do have artifacts and we know about artifacts only then we'll come to know about the interpretation so this is an artifact where the scan was not properly centered you can see that the superiorly the scan was chopped off and if you look at the superior area it is showing red and when we centered the scan again it is showing green so this should be taken because this is labeled as red disease and usually patients out uh, when they are referred usually start medication without uh, you know having a actual defect so also again OCT uh, uh, because if, if there is a signal blockage either due to opacities or due to PCOs there there will be a again falsely red disease which is highlighted we should also know about uh, green disease because in few patients what happens is that if you look at the retinal scan there is a traction here so the the RNFL thickness superiorly showing 140 microns which is actually not uh, normal so it is hyper normal so if you look at the scan there is a vitromacular traction which is happening and we, this patient should be uh, pro, uh, you know followed up and closely followed up as uh, the VMT releases then we can actually know come to know what has happened to the RNFL and lastly the red disease wherein the OCT mis Technically identifies the area as abnormal as it compares the patient's database with a normative database. So this was a case of a type 5 iridofundal chloroboma and a tilted disc. So we can definitely see the disc otherwise looks fine, but the OCT is showing it as a red disease. So at the end, uh, as uh, uh, everyone also highlighted, and I would again like to hammer that, all these investigations need to be clinically correlated. So uh, you af uh, after doing uh, the, the HUD report is combination of the RNFL scan with the ganglion cell with the visual field defect. So we have this uh, RNFL, uh, there is a superior and inferior defect which is shown in the quadrant map as well. And if you look overlay the uh, visual field points, we can clearly see that the visual field defect is mainly in the RNFL uh, where the RNFL defect is there. So at the end, I would just like to highlight that OCT provides a comprehensive uh, assessment to aid the clinician in early diagnosis and monitoring of progression. However, it does not replace a, uh, the a careful examination and technicians taking the scan should be appropriately trained and interpretation of these scans should be done keeping in mind all these artifacts and should be cl clinically correlated. Thank you. Well, thanks Devang for that uh, near perfect summary. I would just have a last comment from Dr. Vyas before we wind up the session. Thank you, Sushmita. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. You have covered most of the things. I just uh, want to highlight that you have already said that almost 50% of the patients, uh, uh, they have some problem with the OCT image, some artifacts over there. And remaining 50%, you know, some of them would be having an ERM, some of them would be having a cataract, some of them would be having a floaters, some of them would be having a high hyperopia, some of them would be having a high myopia. So still OCT is evolving and uh, probably, you know, we are reaching to the perfection, but still it is little away. So OCT is a good tool. Uh, if you want to do, you do it. But don't consider that it is a substitute for the perimetry. The perimetry is the gold standard, and OCT does help in some of the patients. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for hurrying everybody up because we got the session only 15 minutes late. 25 minutes, <laughs> 25 25 minutes, minutes. late. <laughs> so, and thanks, Amit, for uh, uh, having this course coordinated. Thank you, uh, chairpersons and the speakers, for being there and be supportive. Thank you so much.
once again thanks and uh, the chairpersons are very supportive they all our senior faculties so we couldn't take much discussion because of the paucity of time because it's a cascade effect so without wasting time dr balla uh, next talk of your you are moderating the session yeah please yeah,